This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter 9. In which it appears that a senator is but a man. The light of the cheerful fire shone on the rug and carpet of a cosy parlor, and glittered on the sides of the teacups and well-brightened teapot, as Senator Byrd was drawing off his boots, preparatory to inserting his feet in a pair of new handsome slippers, which his wife had been working for him while away on his senatorial tour. Mrs. Byrd, looking the very picture of delight, was superintending the arrangements of the table ever and anon mingling admonitory remarks to a number of frolicsome juveniles, who were effervescing in all those modes of untold gamble and mischief that have astonished mothers ever since the flood. "'Tom, let the doorknob alone. There's a man. Mary, Mary, don't pull the cat's tail, poor pussy. Jim, you mustn't climb on that table. No, no. You don't know, my dear, what a surprise it is to us all to see you here to-night.' said she at last, when she found a space to say something to her husband. "'Yes, yes, I thought I'd just make a run down, spend the night, and have a little comfort at home. I'm tired to death, and my head aches.' Mrs. Bird cast a glance at a camphor bottle, which stood in the half-open closet, and appeared to meditate an approach to it, but her husband interposed. "'No, no, Mary, no doctoring. A cup of your good hot tea, and some of our good home-living, is what I want.' It's a tiresome business, this legislatin'." And the senator smiled, as if he rather liked the idea of considering himself a sacrifice to his country. "'Well,' said his wife, after the business of the tea-table was getting rather slack, "'and what have they been doing in the Senate?' Now, it was a very unusual thing for gentle little Mrs. Bird ever to trouble her head with what was going on in the House of the State, very wisely considering that she had enough to do to mind her own. Mr. Bird therefore opened his eyes in surprise, and said, "'Not very much of importance.' "'Well, but is it true that they have been passing a law forbidding people to give meat and drink to those poor colored folks that come along? I heard they were talking of some such law, but I didn't think any Christian legislature would pass it.' "'Why, Mary, you are getting to be a politician all at once.' "'No, nonsense. I wouldn't give a flip for all your politics, generally but I think this is something downright cruel and unchristian. I hope, my dear, no such law has been passed." "'There has been a law passed forbidding people to help off the slaves that come over from Kentucky, my dear. So much of that thing has been done by these reckless abolitionists, that our brethren in Kentucky are very strongly excited, and it seems necessary, and no more than Christian and kind, that something should be done by our State to quiet the excitement." "'And what is the law?' It don't forbid us to shelter those poor creatures a night, does it, and to give them something comfortable to eat, and a few old clothes, and send them quietly about their business?" "'Why, yes, my dear. That would be aiding and abetting, you know." Mrs. Bird was a timid, blushing little woman of about four feet in height, and with mild blue eyes, and a peach-blow complexion, and the gentlest, sweetest voice in the world. As for courage, a moderate-sized cock turkey had been known to put her to rout at the very first gobble, and a stout house-dog of moderate capacity would bring her into subjection merely by a show of his teeth. Her husband and children were her entire world, and in these she ruled more by entreaty and persuasion than by command or argument. There was only one thing that was capable of arousing her, and that provocation came in on the side of her unusually gentle and sympathetic nature. Anything in the shape of cruelty would throw her into a passion, which was the more alarming and inexplicable in proportion to the general softness of her nature. Generally the most indulgent and easy to be entreated of all mothers, still her boys had a very reverent remembrance of a most vehement chastisement she once bestowed on them because she found them leagued with several graceless boys of the neighborhood, stoning a defenseless kitten. "'I'll tell you what,' Master Bill used to say, "'I was scared that time. Mother came at me so that I thought she was crazy, and I was whipped and tumbled off to bed, without any supper, before I could get over wondering what had come about. And after that I heard Mother crying outside the door, which made me feel worse than all the rest.' I tell you what, he'd say, we boys never stoned another kitten. 
On the present occasion Mrs. Bird rose quickly, with very red cheeks, which quite improved her general appearance, and walked up to her husband with quite a resolute air, and said, in a determined tone, "'Now, John, I want to know if you think such a law as that is right and Christian.' "'You won't shoot me now, Mary, if I say I do.' "'I never could have thought it of you, John. You didn't vote for it?' "'Even so, my fair politician.' "'You ought to be ashamed, John. Poor homeless, houseless creatures! It's a shameful, wicked, abominable law, and I'll break it, for one, the first time I get a chance, and I hope I shall have a chance, I do. Things have got to a pretty pass if a woman can't give a warm supper and a bed to poor, starving creatures, just because they are slaves, and have been abused and oppressed all their lives, poor things. But, Mary, just listen to me.' Your feelings are all quite right, dear, and interesting, and I love you for them. But then, dear, we mustn't suffer our feelings to run away with our judgment. You must consider it's a matter of private feeling. There are great public interests involved. There is such a state of public agitation rising that we must put aside our private feelings. Now, John, I don't know anything about politics, but I can read my Bible, and there I see that I must feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and comfort the desolate and that Bible I mean to follow. But in cases where your doing so would involve a great public evil— Obeying God never brings on public evils. I know it can't. It's always safest all around to do as He bids us. Now listen to me, Mary, and I can state to you a very clear argument to show— Oh, nonsense, John! You can talk all night, but you wouldn't do it. I put it to you, John. Would you now turn away a poor, shivering, hungry creature from your door? because he was a runaway? Would you now?" Now, if the truth must be told, our senator had the misfortune to be a man who had a particularly humane and accessible nature, and turning away anybody that was in trouble never had been his forte. And what was worse for him in this particular pinch of the argument was that his wife knew it, and, of course, was making an assault on rather an indefensible point. So he had recourse to the usual means of gaining time for such cases made and provided. He said, Ahem, and coughed several times, took out his pocket-handkerchief, and began to wipe his glasses. Mrs. Bird, seeing the defenceless condition of the enemy's territory, had no more conscience than to push her advantage. "'I should like to see you doing that, John. I really should. Turning a woman out of doors in a snowstorm, for instance. Or maybe you'd take her up and put her in jail, wouldn't you? You would make a great hand at that." "'Of course, it would be a very painful duty,' began Mr. Bird, in a moderate tone. "'Duty, John! Don't use that word. You know it isn't a duty. It can't be a duty. If folks want to keep their slaves from running away, let them treat them well. That's my doctrine. If I had slaves, as I hope I never shall have, I'd risk their wanting to run away from me, or you either, John. I tell you, folks don't run away when they are happy, and when they do run, poor creatures, they suffer enough with cold and hunger and fear without everybody's turning against them, and law or no law, I never will, so help me God. Mary, Mary, my dear, let me reason with you. I hate reasoning, John, especially reasoning on such subjects. There's a way you political folks have of coming round and round a plain right thing and you don't believe in it yourselves, when it comes to practice. I know you well enough, John. You don't believe it's right any more than I do, and you wouldn't do it any sooner than I." At this critical juncture, old Cudjo, the black man-of-all-work, put his head in at the door, and wished, "'Mrs. would come into the kitchen!' And our senator, tolerably relieved, looked after his little wife, with a whimsical mixture of amusement and vexation, and, seating himself in the armchair, began to read the papers. After a moment his wife's voice was heard at the door in a quick, earnest tone. "'John! John! I do wish you'd come here a moment!' He laid down his paper, and went into the kitchen, and started, quite amazed, at the sight that presented itself. A young and slender woman, with garments torn and frozen, with one shoe gone, and the stocking torn away from the cut and bleeding foot, was laid back in a deadly swoon upon two chairs. There was the impress of the despised race on her face, yet none could help feeling its mournful and pathetic beauty, while its stony sharpness, its cold, fixed, deathly aspect, struck a solemn chill over him. He drew his breath short, and stood in silence. His wife, 
and their only colored domestic, old Aunt Dinah, were busily engaged in restorative measures, while old Cudjo had got the boy on his knee, and was busy pulling off his shoes and stockings, and chafing his little cold feet. "'Sure, now, if she ain't a sight to behold,' said old Dinah, compassionately. "'Pears like twas the heat that made her faint. She was tolerable pert when she come in, and asked if she couldn't warm herself here a spell, and I was just a-askin' her where she come from, and she fainted right down. Never done much hard work, yes, by the looks of her hands.' "'Poor creature!' said Mrs. Bird compassionately, as the woman slowly unclosed her large, dark eyes and looked vacantly at her. Suddenly an expression of agony crossed her face, and she sprang up, saying, "'Oh, my Harry, have they got him?' The boy, at this, jumped from Cudjo's knee, and running to her side, put up his arms. "'Oh, he's here, he's here!' she exclaimed. "'Oh, ma'am,' she said wildly to Mrs. Bird, "'do protect us. Don't let them get him.' "'Nobody shall hurt you here, poor woman,' said Mrs. Bird, encouragingly. You are safe. Don't be afraid." "'God bless you,' said the woman, covering her face and sobbing, while the little boy, seeing her crying, tried to get into her lap. With many gentle and womanly offices, which none knew better how to render than Mrs. Bird, the poor woman was in time rendered more calm. A temporary bed was provided for her on the settle, near the fire, and, after a short time, she fell into a heavy slumber, with a child, who seemed no less weary, soundly sleeping on her arm. For the mother resisted with nervous anxiety the kindest attempts to take him from her, and even in sleep her arm encircled him with an unrelaxing clasp, as if she could not even then be beguiled of her vigilant hold. Mr. and Mrs. Bird had gone back to the parlour, where, strange as it may appear, no reference was made on either side to the preceding conversation. But Mrs. Bird busied herself with her knitting-work, and Mr. Bird pretended to be reading the paper. "'I wonder who and what she is,' said Mr. Bird at last, as he laid it down. "'When she wakes up and feels a little rested, we will see,' said Mrs. Bird. "'I say, wife,' said Mr. Bird, after musing in silence over his newspaper. "'Well, dear?' She couldn't wear one of your gowns, could she, by any letting down or such matter? She seems to be rather larger than you are." A quite perceptible smile glimmered on Mrs. Bird's face as she answered, "'We'll see.' Another pause, and Mr. Bird again broke out, "'I say, wife, well, what now?' "'Why, there's that old bombazin cloak that you keep on purpose to put over me when I take my afternoon's nap. You might as well give her that. She needs clothes." At this instant Dinah looked in to say that the woman was awake and wanted to see Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Bird went into the kitchen, followed by the two eldest boys, the smaller fry having by this time been safely disposed of in bed. The woman was now sitting up on the settle by the fire. She was looking steadily into the blaze with a calm, heartbroken expression, very different from her former agitated wildness. "'Did you want me?' said Mrs. Bird, in gentle tones. "'I hope you feel better now, poor woman.' A long-drawn, shivering sigh was the only answer, but she lifted her dark eyes, and fixed them on her with such a forlorn and imploring expression that the tears came into the little woman's eyes. "'You needn't be afraid of anything. We are friends here, poor woman. Tell me where you came from, and what you want,' said she. "'I came from Kentucky,' said the woman. When? said Mr. Bird, taking up the interrogatory. Tonight. How did you come? I crossed on the ice. Crossed on the ice, said every one present. Yes, said the woman slowly. I did. God helping me, I crossed on the ice, for they were behind me, right behind, and there was no other way. Law, missus, said Cudjo. The ice is all in broken-up blocks, a swinging and a teetering up and down the river." "'I know it was, I know it,' said she wildly. "'But I did it. I wouldn't have thought I could. I didn't think I could get over. But I didn't care. I could but die if I didn't. The Lord helped me. Nobody knows how much the Lord can help them till they try,' said the woman, with a flashing eye. "'Were you a slave?' said Mr. Bird. "'Yes, sir. I belonged to a man in Kentucky.' "'Was he unkind to you?' No, sir, he was a good master. And was your mistress unkind to you? No, sir, no, my mistress was always good to me. 
What could induce you to leave a good home, then, and run away and go through such dangers?" The woman looked up at Mrs. Bird with a keen, scrutinizing glance, and it did not escape her that she was dressed in deep mourning. "'Ma'am,' she said, suddenly, "'have you ever lost a child?' The question was unexpected, and it was thrust on a new wound, for it was only a month since a darling child of the family had been laid in the grave. Mr. Bird turned around and walked to the window and Mrs. Bird burst into tears, but, recovering her voice, she said, "'Why do you ask that? I have lost a little one. Then you will feel for me. I have lost two, one after another, left them buried there when I came away, and I had only this one left. I never slept a night without him. He was all I had. He was my comfort and pride, day and night, and, ma'am, they were going to take him away from me, to sell him, sell him down south, ma'am, to go all alone, a baby that had never been away from his mother in his life. I couldn't stand it, ma'am. I knew I never should be good for anything if they did, and when I knew the papers, the papers were signed, and he was sold, I took him and came off in the night, and they chased me, the man that brought him, and some of Massa's folks, and they were coming down right behind me, and I heard him. I jumped right on to the ice, and how I got across I don't know. But first I knew a man was helping me up the bank." The woman did not sob nor weep. She had gone to a place where tears are dry. But every one around her was, in some way characteristic of themselves, showing signs of hearty sympathy. The two little boys, after a desperate rummaging in their pockets in search of those pocket-handkerchiefs which mothers know are never to be found there, had thrown themselves disconsolately into the skirts of their mother's gown, where they were sobbing and wiping their eyes and noses to their heart's content. Mrs. Bird had her face fairly hidden in her pocket-handkerchief, and old Dinah, with tears streaming down her black, honest face, was ejaculating, "'Lord, have mercy on us!' with all the fervor of a camp-meeting while old Cudjo, rubbing his eyes very hard with his cuffs, and making a most uncommon variety of wry faces, occasionally responded in the same key, with great fervor. Our senator was a statesman, and of course could not be expected to cry, like other mortals, and so he turned his back to the company and looked out of the window, and seemed particularly busy in clearing his throat and wiping his spectacle-glasses, occasionally blowing his nose in a manner that was calculated to excite suspicion had any one been in a state to observe critically. "'How came you to tell me you had a kind master?' he suddenly exclaimed, gulping down very resolutely some kind of rising in his throat, and turning suddenly round upon the woman. "'Because he was a kind master. I'll say that of him, anyway. And my mistress was kind. But they couldn't help themselves. They were owing money, and there was some way, I can't tell how, that a man had a hold on them and they were obliged to give him his will. I listened, and heard him telling mistress that, and she begging and pleading for me, and he told her he couldn't help himself, and that the papers were all drawn. And then it was I took him, and left my home, and came away. I knew twas no use of my trying to live, if they did it, for it appears like this child is all I have." "'Have you no husband?' "'Yes, but he belongs to another man. His master is real hard to him and won't let him come to see me hardly ever, and he's grown harder and harder upon us, and he threatens to sell him down south. It's like I'll never see him again." The quiet tone in which the woman pronounced these words might have led a superficial observer to think that she was entirely apathetic, but there was a calm, settled depth of anguish in her large, dark eye that spoke of something far otherwise. "'And where do you mean to go, my poor woman?' said Mrs. Bird. "'To Canada, if I only knew where that was. Is it very far off, is Canada?' said she, looking up with a simple, confiding air to Mrs. Bird's face. "'Poor thing!' said Mrs. Bird involuntarily. "'It's a very great way off, think,' said the woman earnestly. "'Much further than you think, poor child,' said Mrs. Bird. "'But we will try to think what can be done for you. Here, Dinah, make her up a bed in your own room, close by the kitchen, and I'll think what to do for her in the morning. Meanwhile, never fear, poor woman. Put your trust in God. He will protect you." Mrs. Bird and her husband re-entered the parlour. 
She sat down in her little rocking chair before the fire, swaying thoughtfully to and fro. Mr. Bird strode up and down the room, grumbling to himself. Pish! Pshaw! Confounded awkward business! At length, striding up to his wife, he said, I say, wife, she'll have to get away from here this very night. That fellow will be down on the scent bright and early to-morrow morning. If twas only the woman, she could lie quiet till it was over. But that little chap can't be kept still by a troop of horse and foot, I'll warrant me. He'll bring it all out, popping his head out of some window or door. A pretty kettle of fish it would be for me, too, to be caught with them both here just now. No, they'll have to be got off to-night. To-night? How is it possible? Where to? Well, I know pretty well where to, said the senator, beginning to put on his boots, with a reflective air, and stopping when his leg was half in, he embraced his knee with both hands, and seemed to go off in deep meditation. It's a confounded awkward, ugly business, said he at last, beginning to tug at his boot-straps again, and that's a fact. After one boot was fairly on, the senator sat with the other in his hand, profoundly studying the figure of the carpet. It will have to be done, though, for aught I see. Hang it all!" And he drew the other boot anxiously on, and looked out of the window. Now little Mrs. Bird was a discreet woman, a woman who never in her life said, I told you so, and on the present occasion, though pretty well aware of the shape her husband's meditations were taking, she very prudently forbore to meddle with them, only sat very quietly in her chair, and looked quite ready to hear her liege lord's intentions when he should think proper to utter them. "'You see,' he said, "'there's my old client, Van Tromp, who has come over from Kentucky, and set all his slaves free, and he has bought a place seven miles up the creek here, back in the woods, where nobody goes unless they go on purpose, and it's a place that isn't found in a hurry. There she'd be safe enough, but the plague of the thing is nobody could drive a carriage there to-night but me.' "'Why not?' Cudjo is an excellent driver. Ay, ay, but here it is. The creek has to be crossed twice, and the second crossing is quite dangerous, unless one knows it as I do. I have crossed it a hundred times on horseback, and know exactly the turns to take. And so, you see, there's no help for it. Cudjo must put in the horses, as quietly as may be, about twelve o'clock, and I'll take her over, and then, to give color to the matter, he must carry me on to the next tavern to take the stage for Columbus that comes by about three or four, and so it will look as if I had had the carriage only for that. I shall get into business bright and early in the morning, but I'm thinking I shall feel rather cheap there, after all that's been said and done, but hang it, I can't help it." "'Your heart is better than your head in this case, John,' said the wife, laying her little white hand on his. "'Could I ever have loved you, had I not known you better than you know yourself?' And the little woman looked so handsome, with the tears sparkling in her eyes, that the senator thought he must be a decidedly clever fellow, to get such a pretty creature into such a passionate admiration of him. And so, what could he do but walk off somberly, to see about the carriage? At the door, however, he stopped a moment, and then, coming back, he said, with some hesitation, "'Mary, I don't know how you'd feel about it, but there's that drawer full of things, of—of—of of poor little Henry's. So saying, he turned quickly on his feet, and shut the door after him. His wife opened the little bedroom door adjoining her room, and, taking the candle, set it down on top of a bureau there. Then from a small recess she took a key, and put it thoughtfully in a lock of a drawer, and made a sudden pause, while two boys, who, boy-like, had followed close on her heels, stood looking, with silent, significant glances, at their mother. And, oh, mother that reads this! Has there never been in your house a drawer, or a closet, the opening of which has been to you like the opening again of a little grave? Ah, happy mother that you are, if it has not been so!" Mrs. Bird slowly opened the drawer. There were little coats of many a form and pattern, piles of aprons, and rows of small stockings, and even a pair of little shoes, worn and rubbed at the toes, that were peeping from the folds of a paper. There was a toy horse, and a wagon, a top, a ball, memorials gathered with many a tear and many a heartbreak. She sat down by the drawer, and, leaning her head on her hands over it, wept till the tears fell through her fingers into the drawer. Then, suddenly raising her head, she began, with nervous haste, selecting the plainest and most substantial articles, 
and gathering them into a bundle. Mama said one of the boys, gently touching her arm, you going to give away those things? My dear boys, she said softly and earnestly, if our dear loving little Henry looks down from heaven, he would be glad to have us do this. I could not find it in my heart to give them away to any common person, to anybody that was happy, but I give them to a mother more heartbroken and sorrowful than I am, and I hope God will send his blessings with them. There are in this world blessed souls, whose sorrows all spring up into joys for others, whose earthly hopes, laid in the grave with many tears, are the seed from which spring healing flowers and balm for the desolate and the distressed. Among such was the delicate woman who sits there by the lamp, dropping slow tears, while she prepares the memorials of her own lost one for the outcast wanderer. After a while Mrs. Bird opened a wardrobe, and, taking from thence a plain, serviceable dress or two, sat down busily to her work-table, and, with needle, scissors, and thimble at hand, quietly commenced the letting-down process which her husband had recommended, and continued busily at it till the old clock in the corner struck twelve, and she heard the low rattling of wheels at the door. "'Mary,' said her husband, coming in, with his overcoat in his hand, you must wake her up now. We must be off." Mrs. Bird hastily deposited the various articles she had collected in a small plain trunk, and, locking it, desired her husband to see it in the carriage, and then proceeded to call the woman. Soon, arrayed in a cloak, bonnet, and shawl that had belonged to her benefactress, she appeared at the door with her child in her arms. Mr. Bird hurried her into the carriage, and Mrs. Bird pressed on after her to the carriage steps. Eliza leaned out of the carriage and put out her hand, a hand as soft and beautiful as was given in return. She fixed her large, dark eyes, full of earnest meaning, on Mrs. Bird's face, and seemed going to speak. Her lips moved. She tried once or twice, but there was no sound, and, pointing upward, with a look never to be forgotten, she fell back in the seat and covered her face. The door was shut, and the carriage drove on. What a situation now! for a patriotic senator that had been all the week before spurring up the legislature of his native state to pass more stringent resolutions against escaping fugitives, their harborers and abettors. Our good senator in his native state had not been exceeded by any of his brethren at Washington in the sort of eloquence which has won for them immortal renown. How sublimely he had sat with his hands in his pocket! and scouted all sentimental weakness of those who would put the welfare of a few miserable fugitives before great state interests. He was as bold as a lion about it, and mightily convinced, not only himself, but everybody that heard him. But then his idea of a fugitive was only an idea of the letters that spell the word, or, at the most, the image of a little newspaper picture of a man with a stick and bundle, with ran away from the subscriber under it. The magic of the real presence of distress, the imploring human eye, the frail, trembling human hand, the despairing appeal of helpless agony, these he had never tried. He had never thought that a fugitive might be a hapless mother, a defenseless child, like that one which was now wearing his lost boy's little well-known cap. And so, as our poor senator was not stone or steel, as he was a man, and a downright noble-hearted one, too, he was, as everybody must see, in a sad case for his patriotism. And you need not exult over him, good brother of the southern states, for we have some inklings that many of you, under similar circumstances, would not do much better. We have reason to know, in Kentucky, as in Mississippi, are noble and generous hearts, to whom never was tale of suffering told in vain. Ah, good brother! Is it fair for you to expect of us services which your own brave, honorable heart would not allow you to render, were you in our place? Be that as it may, if our good senator was a political sinner, he was in a fair way to expiate it by his night's penance. There had been a long, continuous period of rainy weather, and the soft, rich earth of Ohio, as every one knows, is admirably suited to the manufacture of mud and the road was an Ohio railroad of the good old times. 
"'And pray what sort of a road may that be?' says some eastern traveller, who has been accustomed to connect no ideas with a railroad but those of smoothness or speed. Know then, innocent eastern friend, that in benighted regions of the West, where the mud is of unfathomable and sublime depth, roads are made of round, rough logs, arranged transversely side by side, and coated over in their pristine freshness with earth, turf, and whatsoever may come to hand, and then the rejoicing native calleth it a road, and straightway essayeth to ride thereupon. In process of time the rains wash off all the turf and grass aforesaid, move the logs hither and thither in picturesque positions, up, down, and crosswise, with divers chasms and ruts of black mud intervening. Over such a road as this our senator went stumbling along, making moral reflections as continuously as under the circumstances could be expected. The carriage proceeding along much as follows. Bump! 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 Slush! Down in the mud! The senator, woman and child, reversing their positions so suddenly as to come, without any very accurate adjustment, against the windows of the downhill side. Carriage sticks fast while Kudjo, on the outside, is heard making a great muster among the horses. After various ineffectual pullings and twitchings, just as the senator is losing all patience, the carriage suddenly rights itself with a bounce. Two front wheels go down into another abyss, and senator, woman, and child all tumble promiscuously on to the front seat. Senator's hat is jammed over his eyes and nose quite unceremoniously, and he considers himself fairly extinguished. Child cries and Kudjo on the outside delivers animated addresses to the horses, who are kicking and floundering and straining under repeated cracks of the whip. Carriage springs up with another bounce. Down go the hind wheels. Senator, woman, and child fly over on the back seat, his elbows encountering her bonnet, and both her feet being jammed into his hat, which flies off in the concussion. After a few moments the slough is passed, and the horses stop panting. The senator finds his hat, the woman straightens her bonnet, and hushes her child, and they brace themselves for what is yet to come. For a while only the continuous bump, bump, intermingled just by way of variety with divers side plunges and compound shakes, and they begin to flatter themselves that they are not so badly off after all. At last, with a square plunge, which puts all on to their feet, and then down into their seats with incredible quickness, the carriage stops and after much outside commotion, Kudjo appears at the door. "'Please, sir, it's a powerful bad spot this yar. I don't know how we's to get clear out. I'm a-thinkin' we'll have to be uh, getting rails.' The senator despairingly steps out, picking gingerly for some firm foothold. Down goes one foot in immeasurable depth. He tries to pull it up, loses his balance, and tumbles over into the mud, and is fished out in a very despairing condition by Kudjo. But we forbear, out of sympathy to our readers' bones, western travellers who have beguiled the midnight hour in the interesting process of pulling down rail fences to pry their carriages out of mud-holes, will have a respectful and mournful sympathy with our unfortunate hero. We beg them to drop a silent tear and pass on. It was full late in the night when the carriage emerged, dripping and bespattered, out of the creek, and stood at the door of a large farmhouse. It took no inconsiderable perseverance to arouse the inmates, but at last the respectable proprietor appeared, and undid the door. He was a great, tall, bristling orson of a fellow, full six feet and some inches in his stockings, and arrayed in a red flannel hunting shirt. A very heavy mat of sandy hair, in a decidedly tousled condition, and a beard of some day's growth, gave the worthy man an appearance, to say the least, not particularly prepossessing. He stood for a few minutes holding the candle aloft, and blinking on our travellers with a dismal and mystified expression that was truly ludicrous. It cost some effort of our senator to induce him to comprehend the case fully. And while he is doing his best at that, we shall give him a little introduction to our readers. Honest old John Van Tromp was one quite a considerable landowner and slave-owner in the state of Kentucky having nothing of the bear about him but the skin, and being gifted by nature with a great, honest, just heart, quite equal to his gigantic frame, 
he had been for some years witnessing with repressed uneasiness the workings of a system equally bad for oppressor and oppressed. At last, one day, John's great heart had swelled altogether too big to wear his bonds any longer. So he just took his pocket-book out of his desk, and went over into Ohio, and bought a quarter of a township of good, rich land, made out free papers for all his people, men, women, and children, packed them up in wagons, and sent them off to settle down. And then Honest John turned his face up the creek, and sat quietly down on a snug retired farm, to enjoy his conscience and his reflections. "'Are you the man that will shelter a poor woman and child from slave-catchers?' said the senator explicitly. "'I rather think I am,' said Honest John, with some considerable emphasis. "'I thought so,' said the senator. If there's anybody comes," said the good man, stretching his tall, muscular form upward, why, here I'm ready for him, and I've got seven sons, each six foot high, and they'll be ready for him. Give our respects to em," said John. Tell em it's no matter how soon they call. Make no kinder difference to us," said John, running his fingers through the shock of hair that thatched his head, and bursting out into a great laugh. Weary, jaded, and spiritless, Eliza dragged herself up to the door, with her child lying in a heavy sleep on her arm. The rough man held the candle to her face, and, uttering a kind of compassionate grunt, opened the door of a small bedroom adjoining to the large kitchen where they were standing, and motioned her to go in. He took down a candle, and, lighting it, set it upon the table, and then addressed himself to Eliza. "'Now, I say, gal, you needn't be a bit afeard. Let who will come here.' I'm up to all that sort of thing," he said, pointing to two or three goodly rifles over the mantelpiece. And most people that know me know that twouldn't be healthy to try to get anybody out of my house when I'm agin it. So now you just go to sleep now, as quiet as if your mother was a rockin' you," said he, as he shut the door. Why, this is an uncommon handsome one," said he to the senator. Ah, well, handsome ones has the greatest cause to run sometimes if they has any kind of feeling, such as decent women should. I know all about that." The senator, in a few words, briefly explained Eliza's history. "'Oh! Oh! Ah! Oh, now I want to know,' said the good man pitifully. "'Show! Now show! That's nature now, poor critter! Hunted down now like a deer! Hunted down just for having natural feelings, and doing what no kind of mother could help but doing. I tell you what, these yer things make me come the nighs to swearin' now almost anything," said Honest John, as he wiped his eyes with the back of a great freckled yellow hand. I tell you what, stranger, it was years and years before I jined the church, cause the ministers round in our parts used to preach that the Bible went in for these ere cuttings up, and I couldn't be up to em with their Greek and Hebrew, and so I took up agin em, Bible and all. I never jined the church till I found a minister that was up to him, all in Greek and all that, and he said right the contrary. And then I took right hold and jined the church. I did now. Fact," said John, who had been all this time uncorking some very frisky bottled cider, which at this juncture he presented. "'Ye'd better just put up here now till daylight,' said he heartily, and I'll call up the old woman and have a bed got ready for you in no time. Thank you, my good friend," said the senator. I must be along to take the night stage for Columbus. Ah, well, then, if you must, I'll go a piece with you, and show you a cross-road that will take you there better than the road you came on. That road's mighty bad." John equipped himself, and, with a lantern in hand, was soon seen guiding the senator's carriage towards a road that ran down in a hollow back of his dwelling. When they parted, the senator put into his hand a ten-dollar bill. It's for her," he said briefly. Ay, ay," said John, with equal conciseness. They shook hands and parted. End of chapter 9「Recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter 10. The Property is Carried Off. 
The February morning looked gray and drizzling through the window of Uncle Tom's cabin. It looked on downcast faces, the images of mournful hearts. The little table stood out before the fire, covered with an ironing cloth. A coarse but clean shirt or two, fresh from the iron, hung on the back of a chair by the fire, and Aunt Chloe had another spread out before her on the table. Carefully she rubbed and ironed every fold and every hem, with the most scrupulous exactness, every now and then raising her hand to her face, to wipe off the tears that were coursing down her cheeks. Tom sat by, with his testament open on his knee, and his head leaning upon his hand. But neither spoke. It was yet early, and the children lay all asleep together in their little rude trundle-bed. Tom, who had to the full the gentle domestic heart, which woe for them, has been a peculiar characteristic of his unhappy race, got up and walked silently to look at his children. "'It's the last time,' he said. Aunt Chloe did not answer, only rubbed away over and over on the coarse shirt, already as smooth as hands could make it, and finally, setting her iron suddenly down with a despairing plunge, she sat down to the table, and lifted up her voice and wept. "'Suppose we must be resigned. Oh, but, O oh Lord, how can I? If I'd known anything whar you're going, or, or how they'd sarve you, Mrs. says she'll try and deem you in a year or two. But, Lord, nobody never comes up that goes down thar. They kills em. I've hearn em tell how they works em up on them our plantations. There'll be the same God there, Cleo, that there is here. Well, said Aunt Cleo, suppose there will. But the Lord lets dreadful things happen sometimes. I don't seem to get no comfort that way. I'm in the Lord's hands, said Tom. Nothing can go no further than he lets it. And there's one thing I can thank him for. It's me that's sold and going down, and not you nor the children. Here you're safe. What comes will come only on me, and the Lord, he'll help me. I know he will. Ah, brave manly heart, smothering thine own sorrow to comfort thy beloved ones. Tom spoke with a thick utterance, and with a bitter choking in his throat, but he spoke brave and strong. "'Let's uh, think on our marcies,' he said tremulously, as if he was quite sure he needed to think on them very hard indeed. "'Marcies!' said Aunt Chloe. "'Don't see no marcies. Tain't right. Tain't right it should be so. Master never ought to left it so that he could be took for his debts. Eve aren't him all he gets for you twice over. He owed you your freedom, and ought to get to your years ago. Maybe he can't help himself now, but I feel it's wrong. Nothing can't beat that ar out of me. Such a faithful critter as you been, and allers sought his business for your own every way, and reckoned on him more than your own wife and chillin. Them as sells hearts, love, and hearts, blood, to get out thar scrapes, the Lord be up to him. Chloe, now, if you love me, you won't talk so, when perhaps just the last time we'll ever have together. And I'll tell you, Chloe, it goes agin me to hear one word agin, Massa. What he put in my arms a baby? It's nature I should think a heap of him, and he couldn't be spected to think so much of poor Tom. Masters used to have an all days year things done for him, and natly they don't think so much on't. They can't be spected to no way. Set up alongside of other masses, who's had the treatment and living I've had? And he never would have let this yar come on me if he could have seen it aforehand. I know he wouldn't. Well, anyway, there's wrong about somewhere," said Chloe, in whom a stubborn sense of justice was a predominant trait. I can't just make out whar tis. But there's wrong somewhere. I'm clear on that. You ought to look up to the Lord above. He's above all. There don't a sparrow fall without him. It don't seem to comfort me, but I spect it order, said Aunt Chloe. But there's no use talk, and I'll just wet up the corn cake and get you one good breakfast, cause nobody knows when you'll get another. In order to appreciate the sufferings of the negroes sold south, it must be remembered that all the instinctive affections of that race are peculiarly strong. Their local attachments are very abiding. They are not naturally daring and enterprising, but home-loving and affectionate. Add to this all the terrors with which ignorance invests the unknown, 
and add to this, again, that selling to the South is set before the negro from childhood as the last severity of punishment. The threat that terrifies more than whipping or torture of any kind is the threat of being sent down river. We have ourselves heard this feeling expressed by them, and seen the unaffected horror with which they will sit in their gossiping hours, and tell frightful stories of that down river, which to them is that undiscovered country from whose bourn no traveller returns. Note, a slightly inaccurate quotation from Hamlet, Act Three, Scene One, Lines 369 to 370. A missionary figure among the fugitives in Canada told us that many of the fugitives confessed themselves to have escaped from comparatively kind masters, and that they were induced to brave the perils of escape, in almost every case, by the desperate horror with which they regarded being sold south a doom which was hanging either over themselves or their husbands, their wives, or children. This nerves the African, naturally patient, timid, and unenterprising, with heroic courage, and leads him to suffer hunger, cold, pain, the perils of the wilderness, and the more dread penalties of recapture. The simple morning meal now smoked on the table, for Mrs. Shelby had excused Aunt Chloe's attendance at the great house that morning. The poor soul had expended all her little energies on this farewell feast, had killed and dressed her choicest chicken, and prepared her corn-cake with scrupulous exactness, just to her husband's taste, and brought out certain mysterious jars on the mantelpiece, some preserves that were never produced except on extreme occasions. "'Lor, Pete,' said Mose, triumphantly, "'hadn't we got a buster of a breakfast?' at the same time catching at a fragment of the chicken. Aunt Chloe gave him a sudden box on the ear. "'There now, crowing over the last breakfast your poor daddy's going to have to home.' "'Oh, Chloe,' said Tom gently. "'Well, I can't help it,' said Aunt Chloe, hiding her face in her apron. "'I so tossed about it, it makes me act ugly.' The boys stood quite still, looking first at their father and then at their mother, while the baby, climbing up her clothes, began an imperious commanding cry. Dar said Aunt Chloe, wiping her eyes and taking up the baby. "'Now I's done, I hope. Now do eat something. This here's my nicest chicken. Thar, boys, ye shall have some, poor critters. Your mammy's been cross to yer." The boys needed no second invitation, and went in with great zeal for the eatables. And it was well they did so, as otherwise there would have been very little performed to any purpose by the party. "'Now,' said Aunt Chloe, bustling about after breakfast, I must put up your clothes, just like as not he'll take em all away. I know their ways, mean as dirt they is. Well, now, your flannels for rheumatiz is in this corner, so be careful, cause there won't nobody make you no more. Then here's your old shirts, and these yer is new ones. I towed off these your stockings last night, and put the ball in em to mend with, but lor, who'll ever mend for you? And Aunt Chloe, again overcome, laid her head on the box side and sobbed to think on it. No critter to do for you, sick or well. I don't really think I ought to be good now." The boys, having eaten everything there was on the breakfast-table, began now to take some thought of the case, and seeing their mother crying and their father looking very sad, began to whimper and put their hand to their eyes. Uncle Tom had the baby on his knee, and was letting her enjoy herself to the utmost extent, scratching his face and pulling his hair and occasionally breaking out into clamorous explosions of delight, evidently arising out of her own internal reflections. "'Ah, crow away, poor critter,' said Aunt Chloe. "'You'll have to come to it, too. You'll live to see your husband sold, or maybe be sold yourself. And these yer boys, they's to be sold, I suppose, too, just like as not. When day gets good for something, ain't no use in niggers having nothing.' Here one of the boys called out, "'There's Mrs. a-comin' in. She can't do no good.' "'What's she coming for?' said Aunt Chloe. Mrs. Shelby entered. Aunt Chloe set a chair for her in a manner decidedly gruff and crusty. She did not seem to notice either the action or the manner. She looked pale and anxious. "'Tom,' she said, "'I come to—' And stopping suddenly, and regarding the silent group, she sat down in the chair, and covering her face with her handkerchief, began to sob. "'Lord, now, Mrs. Don't—' "'Don't!' said Aunt Chloe, bursting out in her turn, and for a few moments they all wept in company. And in those tears they all shed together, the high and the lowly, melted away all the heart-burnings and anger of the oppressed. 
O oh, ye who visit the distressed! Do ye know that everything your money can buy, given with a cold, averted face, is not worth one honest tear shed in real sympathy? My good fellow, said Mrs. Shelby, I can't give you anything to do you any good. If I give you money, it will only be taken from you. But I tell you solemnly and before God that I will keep trace of you, and bring you back as soon as I can command the money. Until then, trust in God. Here the boys called out that Massa Haley was coming, and then an unceremonious kick pushed open the door. Haley stood there in very ill humor, having ridden hard the night before, and being not at all pacified by his ill success in recapturing his prey. Come, said he, ye nigger, ye ready? Servant, ma'am, said he, taking off his hat as he saw Mrs. Shelby. Aunt Chloe shut and corded the box, and getting up, looked gruffly on the trader, her tears seeming suddenly turned to sparks of fire. Tom rose up meekly to follow his new master, and raised up his heavy box on his shoulder. His wife took the baby in her arms to go with him to the wagon, and the children, still crying, trailed on behind. Mrs. Shelby, walking up to the trader, detained him for a few moments, talking with him in an earnest manner and while she was thus talking the whole family party proceeded to a wagon that stood ready harnessed at the door. A crowd of all the old and young hands on the place stood gathered around it to bid farewell to their old associate. Tom had been looked up to, both as a head-servant and a Christian teacher, by all the place, and there was much honest sympathy and grief about him, particularly among the women. "'Why, Chloe, you buy it better than we do!' said one of the women, who had been weeping freely, noticing the gloomy calmness with which Aunt Chloe stood by the wagon. "'I's done my tears,' she said, looking grimly at the trader, who was coming up. "'I does not feel to cry for dat o' our old limb, nohow.' "'Get in,' said Haley to Tom, as he strode through the crowd of servants who looked at him with lowering brows. Tom got in, and Haley, drawing out from under the wagon seat a heavy pair of shackles, made them fast around each ankle. A smothered groan of indignation ran through the whole circle, and Mrs. Shelby spoke from the veranda. "'Mr. Haley, I assure you that precaution is entirely unnecessary.' "'Don't know, ma'am. I've lost one five hundred dollars from this yar place, and I can't afford to run no more risks.' "'What else could she spect on him?' said Aunt Chloe indignantly, while the two boys, who now seemed to comprehend at once their father's destiny, clung to her gown, sobbing and growing vehemently. "'I'm sorry,' said Tom, "'that Massa George happened to be away.' George had gone to spend two or three days with a companion on a neighboring estate, and having departed early in the morning, before Tom's misfortune had been made public, had left without hearing of it. "'Give my love to Massa George,' he said earnestly. Haley whipped up the horse, and, with a steady, mournful look, fixed to the last on the old place, Tom was whirled away. Mr. Shelby at this time was not at home. He had sold Tom under the spur of a driving necessity to get out of the power of a man whom he dreaded, and his first feeling after the consummation of the bargain had been that of relief. But his wife's expostulations awoke his half-slumbering regrets, and Tom's manly disinterestedness increased the unpleasantness of his feelings. It was in vain that he said to himself that he had a right to do it, that everybody did it and that some did it without even the excuse of necessity. He could not satisfy his own feelings, and that he might not witness the unpleasant scenes of the consummation, he had gone on a short business tour up the country, hoping that all would be over before he returned. Tom and Haley rattled on along the dusty road, whirling past every old familiar spot, until the bounds of the estate were fairly passed, and they found themselves out on the open pike. After they had ridden about a mile, Haley suddenly drew up at the door of a blacksmith's shop, when, taking out with him a pair of handcuffs, he stepped into the shop to have a little alteration in them. "'These here is a little too small for his build,' said Haley, showing the fetters and pointing out to Tom. "'Lor, now, if thar ain't Shelby's Tom! He hadn't sold him now,' said the smith. "'Yes, he has,' said Haley. "'Now ye don't! Well, really,' said the smith. Who'd a thought it? Why, ye needn't go to fetterin' him up this yar way. He's the faithfulest, best creeter 
"'Yes, yes,' said Haley. "'But your good fellers are just the critter to want her run off. Them stupid ones as don't care where they go, and shiftless drunken ones as don't care for nothing, they'll stick by, and like as not be rather pleased to be toted around. But days ye are prime fellers, they hates it like sin. No way but to fetter em. Got legs? They'll use em. No mistake." "'Well,' said the smith, feeling among his tools, "'them plantations down thar, stranger, ain't just the place a Kentuck nigger wants to go to. They dies thar tolerable fast, don't they?' "'Well, yes, tolerable fast their they're dying is, what with the clematin' and one thing another, and, and they dies so as to keep the market up pretty brisk,' said Haley. "'Well, a feller can't help thinking it's a mighty pity to have a nice, quiet, likely feller, as good as and as Tom is, go down to be fairly ground up on one of them thar sugar plantations. Well, he's got a far chance. I promise to do well by him. I'll get him in house servant in some good old family, and then, if he stands the fever and clematin, he'll have a berth good as any nigger ought to ask for. He leaves his wife and chillin up there, I suppose. Yes, see, he'll get another thar. Lord, thar's women enough everywhere, said Haley. Tom was sitting very mournfully on the outside of the shop while this conversation was going on. Suddenly he heard the quick, short click of a horse's hoof behind him, and before he could fairly awake from his surprise, young Master George sprang into the wagon, threw his arms tumultuously round his neck, and was sobbing and scolding with energy. "'I declare it's real mean. I don't care what they say, any of them. It's a nasty, mean shame. If I was a man, they shouldn't do it. They should not so," said George, with a kind of subdued howl. "'Oh, Massa George, this does me good,' said Tom. "'I couldn't bar to go off without seeing you. It does me real good. He can't tell.' Here Tom made some movement of his feet, and George's eye fell on the fetters. "'What a shame!' he exclaimed, lifting his hands. "'I'll knock that old fellow down, I will.' "'No, you won't, Massa George. And you must not talk so loud. It won't help me any to anger him.' "'Well, I won't, then, for your sake, but only to think of it. Isn't it a shame? They never sent for me, nor sent me any word, and if it hadn't been for Tom Lincoln I shouldn't have heard it. I tell you, I blew em up well, all of em at home.' "'Thar wasn't right, I'm feared, Master Tom.' "'Can't help it. I say it's a shame.' "'Look here, Uncle Tom,' said he, turning his back to the shop and speaking in a mysterious tone, "'I've brought you my dollar.' "'Oh, I wouldn't think of taking on't, Massa George. No ways in the world,' said Tom, quite moved. "'But you shall take it,' said George. "'Look here. I told Aunt Chloe I'd do it, and she advised me just to make a hole in it and put a string through it so you would hang it round your neck and keep it out of sight, else this mean scamp would take it away. I tell you, Tom, I want to blow him up. It would do me good.' "'No, don't, Massa George.' for it won't do me any good." "'Well, I won't, for your sake,' said George, busily tying his dollar round Tom's neck. "'But there, now, button your coat tight over it, and keep it, and remember, every time you see it, that I'll come down after you and bring you back. Aunt Chloe and I have been talking about it, and I told her not to fear. I'll see to it, and I'll tease father's life out if he don't do it.' "'Oh, Massa George, you mustn't talk so about your father.' "'Lord, Uncle Tom, I don't mean anything bad.' And now, Massa George, said Tom, ye must be a good boy. Remember how many hearts is sought on ye. Always keep close to your mother. Don't be getting into any of them foolish ways boys has a getting too big to mind their mothers. Tell you what, Massa George, the Lord gives good many things twice over, but he won't give you a mother but once. You'll never see such another woman, Massa George, if you live to be a hundred years old. So now you hold on to her and grow up and be a comfort to her. There's my own good boy. You will now, won't you? Yes, I will, Uncle Tom, said George seriously. And be careful of your speaking, Massa George. Young boys, when it comes to your age, is willful sometimes. It is nature they should be. But real gentlemen, such as I hope you'll be, never lets fall on words that isn't respectful to their parents. You ain't fended, Massa George. No, indeed, Uncle Tom, you always did give me good advice. I's older, you know, said Tom, stroking the boy's fine curly head with his large, strong hand, but speaking in a voice as tender as a woman's. And I sees all that's bound up in you. Oh, Massa George, you has everything. Larnin', privileges, readin', writin'. 
and you'll grow up to be a great, learned, good man, and all the people on the place, and your mother and father, be so proud on you. Be a good master, like your father, and be a Christian, like your mother. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, Massa George." "'I'll be real good, Uncle Tom, I tell you,' said George. "'I'm going to be a first raider, and don't you be discouraged. I'll have you back to the place yet. As I told Aunt Chloe this morning, I'll build our house all over, and you shall have a room for a parlor with a carpet on it when I'm a man. Oh, you'll have good times yet!' Haley now came to the door with the handcuffs in his hands. "'Look here now, mister,' said George, with an air of great superiority, as he got out. "'I shall let father and mother know how you treat Uncle Tom.' "'You're welcome,' said the trader. "'I should think you'd be ashamed to spend all your life buying men and women and chaining them like cattle. I should think you'd feel mean,' said George. "'So long as your grand folks wants to buy men and women, I'm as good as they is,' said Haley. "'Tain't any meaner selling on em than tis buying.' I'll never do either when I'm a man," said George. I'm ashamed this day that I'm a Kentuckian. I always was proud of it before." And George sat very straight on his horse, and looked round with an air, as if he expected the State would be impressed with his opinion. "'Well, good-bye, Uncle Tom. Keep a stiff upper lip,' said George. "'Good-bye, Master George,' said Tom, looking fondly and admiringly at him. "'God Almighty bless you. Ah, Kentucky hadn't got many like you," he said, in the fullness of his heart, as the frank, boyish face was lost to his view. Away he went, and Tom looked, till the clatter of his horse's heels died away, the last sound or sight of his home. But over his heart there seemed to be a warm spot, where those young hands had placed that precious dollar. Tom put up his hand, and held it close to his heart. "'Now, I tell you what, Tom,' said Haley, as he came up to the wagon, and threw in the handcuffs, "'I mean to start far with you, as I generally do with my niggers. But I'll tell you now, to begin with, you treat me far, and I'll treat you far. I ain't never hard on my niggers. Calculates to do the best for em I can. Now, you see, you'd better just settle down comfortable, and not be trying no tricks, because niggers' tricks of all sorts I'm up to, and it's no use.' If niggers is quiet and don't try to get off, they has good times with me. And if they don't, why, it's their fault and not mine." Tom assured Haley that he had no present intentions of running off. In fact, the exhortation seemed rather a superfluous one to a man with a great pair of iron fetters on his feet. But Mr. Haley had got in the habit of commencing his relations with his stock with little exhortations of this nature, calculated, as he deemed, to inspire cheerfulness and confidence and prevent the necessity of any unpleasant scenes. And here, for the present, we take our leave of Tom, to pursue the fortunes of other characters in our story. End of chapter 10《Fox Recording》All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe, Chapter Eleven, in which property gets into an improper state of mind. It was late in a drizzly afternoon that a traveller alighted at the door of a small country hotel in the village of N, in Kentucky. In the bar room he found assembled quite a miscellaneous company, whom stress of weather had driven to harbour, and the place presented the usual scenery of such reunions great, tall, raw-boned Kentuckians attired in hunting-shirts, and trailing their loose joints over a vast extent of territory, with the easy lounge peculiar to the race, rifles stacked away in the corner, shot-pouches, game-bags, hunting-dogs, and little negroes, all rolled together in the corners, were the characteristic features in the picture. At each end of the fireplace sat a long-legged gentleman, with his chair tipped back, his hat on his head, and the heels of his muddy boots reposing sublimely on the mantelpiece, a position, we will inform our readers, decidedly favorable to the turn of reflection incident to western taverns, where travellers exhibit a decided preference for this particular mode of elevating their understandings. Mine host, who stood behind the bar, like most of his countrymen, was great of stature, good-natured, and loose-jointed, with an enormous shock of hair on his head, 
and a great tall hat on the top of that. In fact, everybody in the room bore on his head this characteristic emblem of man's sovereignty, whether it were felt hat, palm leaf, greasy beaver, or fine new chapeau, there it reposed with true republican independence. In truth, it appeared to be the characteristic mark of every individual. Some wore them tipped rakishly to one side. These were your men of humor, jolly, free-and-easy dogs. Some had them jammed independently down over their noses. These were your hard characters, thorough men, who, when they wore their hats, wanted to wear them, and to wear them just as they had a mind to. There were those who had them set far over back, wide-awake men who wanted a clear prospect, while careless men who did not know or care how their hats sat had them shaking about in all directions. The various hats, in fact, were quite a Shakespearean study. Divers negroes in very free-and-easy pantaloons, and with no redundancy in the shirt-line, were scuttling about hither and thither, without bringing to pass any very particular results, except expressing a generic willingness to turn over everything in creation generally for the benefit of Masser and his guests. Add to this picture a jolly, crackling, rollicking fire, going rejoicingly up a great wide chimney. The outer door and every window being set wide open, and the calico window-curtain flopping and snapping in a good stiff breeze of damp raw air, and you have an idea of the jollities of a Kentucky tavern. Your Kentuckian of the present day is a good illustration of the doctrine of transmitted instincts and peculiarities. His fathers were mighty hunters, men who lived in the woods, and slept under the free open heavens, with the stars to hold their candles. And their descendant, to this day, always acts as if the house were his camp wears his hat at all hours, tumbles himself about, and puts his heels on the tops of chairs or mantelpieces, just as his father rolled on the green sward, and put his upon trees and logs, keeps all the windows and doors open, winter and summer, that he may get air enough for his great lungs, calls everybody stranger with nonchalant bonhomie, and is altogether the frankest, easiest, most jovial creature living. Into such an assembly of the free and easy our traveller entered. He was a short, thick-set man, carefully dressed with a round, good-natured countenance, and something rather fussy and particular in his appearance. He was very careful of his valise and umbrella, bringing them in with his own hands, and resisting, pertinaciously, all offers from the various servants to relieve him of them. He looked round the bar-room with rather an anxious air and retreating with his valuables to the warmest corner, disposed them under his chair, sat down, and looked rather apprehensively up at the worthy, whose heels illustrated the end of the mantelpiece, who was spitting from right to left, with a courage and energy rather alarming to gentlemen of weak nerves and particular habits. "'I say, stranger, how are you?' said the aforesaid gentleman, firing an honorary salute of tobacco-juice in the direction of the new arrival. "'Well, I reckon.' was the reply of the other, as he dodged, with some alarm, the threatening honor. "'Any news?' said the respondent, taking out a strip of tobacco and a large hunting-knife from his pocket. "'Not that I know of,' said the man. "'Chaw!' said the first speaker, handing the old gentleman a bit of his tobacco, with a decidedly brotherly air. "'No, thank ye. It don't agree with me,' said the little man, edging off. "'Don't, eh?' said the other, easily, and stowing away the morsel in his own mouth, in order to keep up the supply of tobacco-juice for the general benefit of society. The old gentleman uniformly gave a little start whenever his long-sided brother fired in his direction, and this being observed by his companion, he very good-naturedly turned his artillery to another quarter, and proceeded to storm one of the fire-irons with a degree of military talent fully sufficient to take a city. "'What's that?' said the old gentleman, observing some of the company formed in a group round a large handbill. "'Nigger advertised,' said one of the company, briefly. Mr. Wilson, for that was the old gentleman's name, rose up, and after carefully adjusting his valise and umbrella, proceeded deliberately to take out his spectacles and fix them on his nose, and, this operation being performed, read as follows. "'Ran away from the subscriber, my mulatto boy, George.' said george six feet in height a very light mulatto brown curly hair is very intelligent speaks handsomely 
can read and write, will probably try to pass for a white man, is deeply scarred on his back and shoulders, has been branded in his right hand with the letter H. I will give four hundred dollars for him alive, and the same sum for satisfactory proof that he has been killed. The old gentleman read this advertisement from end to end in a low voice, as if he were studying it. The long-legged veteran, who had been besieging the fire-iron, as before related, now took down his cumbrous length, and, rearing aloft his tall form, walked up to the advertisement, and very deliberately spit a full discharge of tobacco-juice on it. "'There's my mind upon that!' said he, briefly, and sat down again. "'Why, now, stranger, what's that for?' said mine host. "'I'd do it all the same to the writer of that our paper, if he was here.' said the long man, coolly resuming his old employment of cutting tobacco. "'Any man that owns a boy like that, and can't find any better way of treatin' on him, deserves to lose him. Such papers as these is a shame to Kentucky. That's my mind right out, if anybody wants to know.' "'Well, now, that's a fact,' said mine host, as he made an entry in his book. "'I've got a gang of boys, sir,' said the long man, resuming his attack on the fire-irons. "'And I just tells him, "'Boys,' says I, Run now, dig, put, just when you want to. I never shall come to look after you. That's the way I keep em. Let em know they are free to run any time, and it just breaks up their wantin' to. More and all, I've got free papers for em all recorded, in case I gets keeled up any of these times, and they know it. And I tell you, stranger, there ain't a fellow in our parts gets more out of his niggers than I do. Why, my boys have been to Cincinnati, with five hundred dollars worth of colts and brought me back the money, all straight, time and again. It stands to reason they should. Treat em like dogs, and you'll have dogs' work and dogs' actions. Treat em like men, and you'll have men's works." And the honest drover, in his warmth, endorsed this moral sentiment by firing a perfect feu de joie at the fireplace. "'I think you're altogether right, friend,' said Mr. Wilson. "'And this boy described here is a fine fellow, no mistake about that. He worked for me some half-dozen years in my bagging factory, and he was my best hand, sir. He is an ingenious fellow, too. He invented a machine for the cleaning of hemp. A really valuable affair. It's gone into use in several factories. His master holds the patent of it." "'I'll warrant you,' said the drover. "'Holds it, and makes money out of it, and then turns round and brands the boy in his right hand. If I had a fair chance, I'd mark him. I reckon so that he'd carry it one while. These yar knowin' boys is allers aggravatin' and sarcy," said a coarse-looking fellow from the other side of the room. "'That's why they gets cut up and marked so. If they behave themselves, they wouldn't. That is to say, the Lord made em men, and it's a hard squeeze gettin' em down into beasts,' said the drover dryly. "'Bright niggers isn't no kind of vantage to their masters,' continued the other, well entrenched in a coarse, unconscious obtuseness from the contempt of his opponent. What's the use of talents and then things, if you can't get the use on them yourself? Why, all the use they make on't is to get round you. I've had one or two of these fellers, and I just sold em down the river. I knew I'd got to lose em, first or last, if I didn't. Better send up to the Lord to make you a set, and leave out their souls entirely," said the drover. Here the conversation was interrupted by the approach of a small one-horse buggy to the inn. It had a genteel appearance and a well-dressed, gentlemanly man sat on the seat, with a colored servant driving. The whole party examined the newcomer with the interest with which a set of loafers in a rainy day usually examine every newcomer. He was very tall, with a dark Spanish complexion, fine, expressive black eyes, and close curling hair, also of a glossy blackness. His well-formed aquiline nose, straight, thin lips, and the admirable contour of his finely formed limbs, impressed the whole company instantly with the idea of something uncommon. He walked easily in among the company, and with a nod indicated to his waiter where to place his trunk, bowed to the company, and, with his hat in his hand, walked up leisurely to the bar, and gave in his name as Henry Butter, Oakland's Shelby County. Turning with an indifferent air, he sauntered up to the advertisement and read it over. "'Jim,' he said to his man, "'seems to me we met a boy something like this up at Berman's, didn't we?' "'Yes, massa,' said Jim. "'Only I ain't sure about the hand.' "'Well, uh, I didn't look, of course,' said the stranger, with a careless yawn. 
Then, walking up to the landlord, he desired him to furnish him with a private apartment, as he had some writing to do immediately. The landlord was all obsequious, and a relay of about seven negroes, old and young, male and female, little and big, were soon whizzing about like a covey of partridges, bustling, hurrying, treading on each other's toes, and tumbling over each other in their zeal to get Mass's room ready, while he seated himself easily on a chair in the middle of the room, and entered into conversation with the man who sat next to him. The manufacturer, Mr. Wilson, from the time of the entrance of the stranger, had regarded him with an air of disturbed and uneasy curiosity. He seemed to himself to have met and been acquainted with him somewhere, but he could not recollect. Every few moments, when the man spoke, or moved, or smiled, he would start and fix his eyes on him, and then suddenly withdraw them, as the bright dark eyes met his with such unconcerned coolness. At last a sudden recollection seemed to flash upon him, for he stared at the stranger with such an air of blank amazement and alarm that he walked up to him. "'Mr. Wilson, I think,' said he, in a tone of recognition, and extending his hand. "'I beg your pardon. I didn't recollect you before. I see you remember me. Mr. Butler of Oakland, Shelby County.' "'Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, sir,' said Mr. Wilson, like one speaking in a dream. Just then a negro boy entered, and announced that Massa's room was ready. "'Jim, see to the trunks,' said the gentleman, negligently. Then addressing himself to Mr. Wilson, he added, "'I should like to have a few moments' conversation with you on business in my room, if you please.' Mr. Wilson followed him, as one who walks in his sleep, and they proceeded to a large upper chamber, where a new-made fire was crackling, and various servants flying about, putting finishing touches to the arrangements. When all was done, and the servants departed, the young man deliberately locked the door, and, putting the key in his pocket, faced about, and, folding his arms on his bosom, looked Mr. Wilson full in the face. "'George!' said Mr. Wilson. "'Yes, George,' said the young man. "'I couldn't have thought it!' "'I am pretty well disguised, I fancy,' said the young man, with a smile. "'A little walnut bark has made my yellow skin a genteel brown, and I've dyed my hair black.' So you see, I don't answer to the advertisement at all. Oh, George, but this is a dangerous game you are playing. I could not have advised you to it. I can do it on my own responsibility, said George, with the same proud smile. We remark, en passant, that George was, by his father's side, of white descent. His mother was one of those unfortunates of her race, marked out by personal beauty, to be the slave of the passions of her possessor and the mother of children who may never know a father. From one of the proudest families in Kentucky he had inherited a set of fine European features, and a high, indomitable spirit. From his mother he had received only a slight mulatto tinge, amply compensated by its accompanying rich dark eye. A slight change in the tint of the skin and the color of his hair had metamorphosed him into the Spanish-looking fellow he then appeared and as gracefulness of movement and gentlemanly manners had always been perfectly natural to him, he found no difficulty in playing the bold part he had adopted, that of a gentleman travelling with his domestic. Mr. Wilson, a good-natured but extremely fidgety and cautious old gentleman, ambled up and down the room, appearing, as John Bunyan hath it, much tumbled up and down in his mind, and divided between his wish to help George and a certain confused notion of maintaining law and order. So, as he shambled about, he delivered himself as follows. "'Well, George, I suppose you're running away, leaving your lawful master, George. I don't wonder at it. At the same time, I'm sorry, George, yes, decidedly. I think I must say that, George, it's my duty to tell you so.' "'Why are you sorry, sir?' said George calmly. "'Why, to see you, as it were, setting yourself in opposition to the laws of your country.' "'My country,' said George, with a strong and bitter emphasis. "'What country have I but the grave? And I wish to God that I was laid there. Why, George, no, no, it won't do. Or this way of talking is wicked, unscriptural. George, you've got a hard master. In fact, he is. Well, he conducts himself reprehensibly. I can't pretend to defend him. But you know how the angel commanded Hagar to return to her mistress, and submit herself under the hand. Note. Genesis 16, the angel bade the pregnant Hagar return to her mistress Sarai, even though Sarai had dealt harshly with her. And the apostle sent back Onesimus to his master. 
Note Philippians 1, 10. Onesimus went back to his master to become no longer a servant, but a brother beloved. "'Don't quote Bible at me that way, Mr. Wilson,' said George, with a flashing eye. "'Don't! For my wife is a Christian, and I mean to be, if ever I get to where I can. But to quote Bible to a fellow in my circumstances is enough to make him give it up altogether. I appeal to God Almighty. I am willing to go with the case to Him, and ask Him if I do wrong to seek my freedom.' "'These feelings are quite natural, George,' said the good-natured man, blowing his nose. "'Yes, they are natural. But it is my duty not to encourage them in you. Yes, my boy, I am sorry for you now. It's a bad case, very bad. But the Apostle says, Let every one abide in the condition in which he is called. We must all submit to the indications of providence, George, don't you see?' George stood with his head drawn back, his arms folded tightly over his broad breast and a bitter smile curling his lips. "'I wonder, Mr. Wilson, if the Indians should come and take you a prisoner away from your wife and children, and want to keep you all your life hoeing corn for them, if you'd think it your duty to abide in the condition in which you were called. I rather think that you'd think the first stray horse you could find an indication of providence, shouldn't you?' The little old gentleman stared with both eyes at this illustration of the case. But, though not much of a reasoner, he had the sense in which some logicians on this particular subject do not excel, that of saying nothing, where nothing could be said. So, as he stood carefully stroking his umbrella, and folding and patting down all the creases in it, he proceeded on with his exhortations in a general way. "'You see, George, you know, now, I always have stood your friend, and whatever I've said, I've said for your good. Now, here. It seems to me you're running an awful risk. You can't hope to carry it out. If you're taken, it will be worse with you than ever. They'll only abuse you, and half kill you, and sell you down the river." "'Mr. Wilson, I know all this,' said George. "'I do run a risk, but—' He threw open his overcoat, and showed two pistols and a bowie-knife. "'There,' he said, "'I'm ready for em. Down south I never will go. No, if it comes to that, I can earn myself at least six feet of free soil, the first and last I shall ever own in Kentucky. Why, George, this state of mind is awful. It's getting really desperate, George. I'm concerned. I'm going to break the laws of your country. My country again. Mr. Wilson, you have a country. But what country have I, or any one like me, born of slave mothers? What laws are there for us? We don't make them. We don't consent to them. We have nothing to do with them. All they do for us is to crush us, and keep us down. Haven't I heard your Fourth of July speeches? Don't you tell us all, once a year, that governments derive their just power from the consent of the governed? Can't a fellow think that hears such things? Can't he put this and that together, and see what comes to? Mr. Wilson's mind was one of those that may not unaptly be represented by a bale of cotton, downy, soft, benevolently fuzzy and confused. He really pitied George with all his heart, and had a sort of dim and cloudy perception of the style of feeling that agitated him. But he deemed it his duty to go on talking good to him with infinite pertinacity. "'George, this is bad. I must tell you, you know, as a friend, You'd better not be meddling with such notions. They are bad, George, very bad, for boys in your condition, very." And Mr. Wilson sat down to a table and began nervously chewing the handle of his umbrella. "'See here now, Mr. Wilson,' said George, coming up and sitting himself determinately down in front of him. "'Look at me now. Don't I sit before you every way, just as much a man as you are? Look at my face. Look at my hands. Look at my body and the young man drew himself up proudly. Why am I not a man, as much as anybody? Well, Mr. Wilson, hear what I can tell you. I had a father, one of your Kentucky gentlemen, who didn't think enough of me to keep me from being sold with his dogs and horses to satisfy the estate when he died. I saw my mother put up at sheriff's sale with her seven children. They were sold before her eyes one by one, all to different masters. And I was the youngest. She came and kneeled down before old Massa, and begged him to buy her with me, that she might have at least one child with her. 
and he kicked her away with his heavy boot. I saw him do it, and the last that I heard was her moans and screams, when I was tied to his horse's neck to be carried off to his place. Well, then? My master traded with one of the men, and bought my oldest sister. She was a pious, good girl, a member of the Baptist Church, and as handsome as my poor mother had been. She was well brought up, and had good manners. At first I was glad she was bought, for I had one friend near me. I was soon sorry for it. Sir, I have stood at the door and heard her whipped, when it seemed as if every blow cut into my naked heart, and I couldn't do anything to help her. And she was whipped, sir, for wanting to live a decent Christian life, such as your laws give no slave-girl a right to live. And at last I saw her chained with a trader's gang, to be sent to market in Orleans. Sent there for nothing else but that, and that's the last I know of her. Well, I grew up, long years and years, no father, no mother, no sister, not a living soul that cared for me more than a dog, nothing but whipping, scolding, starving. Why, sir, I've been so hungry that I have been glad to take the bones they threw to their dogs. And yet, when I was a little fellow, and laid awake whole nights and cried, it wasn't the hunger, it wasn't the whipping I cried for. No, sir, it was for my mother and my sisters. It was because I hadn't a friend to love me on earth. I never knew what peace or comfort was. I never had a kind word spoken to me till I came to work in your factory. Mr. Wilson, you treated me well. You encouraged me to do well, and to learn to read and write, and to try to make something of myself. And God knows how grateful I am for it. Then, sir, I found my wife. You've seen her. You know how beautiful she is. When I found she loved me, when I married her, I scarcely could believe I was alive I was so happy. And, sir, she is as good as she is beautiful. But now what? Why, now comes my master, takes me right away from my work and my friends and all I like, and grinds me down into the very dirt. And why? Because, he says, I forgot who I was. He says to teach me that I am only a nigger. After all, and last of all, he comes between me and my wife, and says I shall give her up and live with another woman. And all this your laws give him power to do, in spite of God or man. Mr. Wilson, look at it. There isn't one of all these things that have broken the hearts of my mother and my sister and my wife and myself, but your laws allow, and give every man power to do in Kentucky, and none can say to him nay. Do you call these the laws of my country? Sir, I haven't any country any more than I have any father. But I'm going to have one. I don't want anything of your country except to be let alone, to go peaceably out of it. And when I get to Canada, where the laws will own me and protect me, that shall be my country, and its laws I will obey. But if any man tries to stop me, let him take care. For I am desperate. I'll fight for my liberty to the last breath I breathe. You say your fathers did it. If it was right for them, it is right for me." This speech, delivered partly while sitting at the table, and partly walking up and down the room, delivered with tears, and flashing eyes, and despairing gestures, was altogether too much for the good-natured old body to whom it was addressed, who had pulled out a great yellow silk pocket-handkerchief and was mopping up his face with great energy. "'Blast em all!' he suddenly broke out. "'Haven't I always said so, the infernal old cusses? I hope I ain't swearing now. Well, go ahead, George, go ahead. But be careful, my boy. Don't shoot anybody, George, unless—well, you'd better not shoot, I reckon. At least I, I wouldn't hit anybody, you know. Where is your wife, George?' he added, as he nervously rose and began walking the room. "'Gone, sir, gone. With her child in her arms, the Lord only knows where. Gone after the North Star, and when we ever meet, or whether we meet at all in this world, no creature can tell. Is it possible? Astonishing! From such a kind family! Kind families get in debt, and the laws of our country allow them to sell the child out of its mother's bosom to pay its master's debts," said George bitterly. Well, well said the honest old man, fumbling in his pocket. I suppose, perhaps, 
I ain't following my judgment. Hang it, I won't follow my judgment, he added suddenly. So here, George. And taking out a roll of bills from his pocket-book, he offered them to George. No, my kind good sir, said George. You've done a great deal for me, and this might get you into trouble. I have money enough, I hope, to take me as far as I need it. No, but you must, George. Money is a great help everywhere. Can't have too much, if you get it honestly. Take it. Do take it now. Do, my boy. On condition, sir, that I may repay it at some future time, I will," said George, taking up the money. And now, George, how long are you going to travel in this way? Not long or far, I hope. It's well carried on, but too bold. And this black fellow, who is he? A true fellow, who went to Canada more than a year ago. He heard, after he got there, that his master was so angry at him for going off that he had whipped his poor old mother, and he has come all the way back to comfort her and get a chance to get her away. Has he got her? Not yet. He has been hanging about the place, and found no chance yet. Meanwhile he is going with me as far as Ohio, to put me among friends that helped him, and then he will come back after her." "'Dangerous, very dangerous,' said the old man. George drew himself up, and smiled disdainfully. The old gentleman eyed him from head to foot with a sort of innocent wonder. "'George, something has brought you out wonderfully. You hold up your head, and speak and move like another man," said Mr. Wilson. "'Because I'm a free man,' said George proudly. "'Yes, sir, I've said, Master, for the last time to any man, I'm free. Take care. You are not sure. You may be taken. All men are free and equal in the grave, if it comes to that, Mr. Wilson,' said George. "'I'm perfectly dumbfounded with your boldness,' said Mr. Wilson come right here to the nearest tavern miss wilson it is so bold and this tavern is so near that they will never think of it and they will look for me on head and you yourself wouldn't know me jim's master don't live in this county he isn't known in these parts besides he is given up nobody is looking after him and nobody will take me up after the advertisement i think but the mark in your hand george drew off his glove and showed a newly healed scar in his hand that is a parting proof of Mr. Harris's regard," he said scornfully. A fortnight ago, he took it into his head to give it to me, because he said he believed I should try to get away one of these days. Looks interesting, doesn't it?" he said, drawing his glove on again. I declare my very blood runs cold when I think of it. Your condition and your risks," said Mr. Wilson. Mine has run cold a good many years, Mr. Wilson. At present it's about up to the boiling point said George. Well, my good sir, continued George, after a few moments' silence, I saw you knew me. I thought I'd just have this talk with you, lest your surprised look should bring me out. I leave early to-morrow morning before daylight. By to-morrow night I hope to sleep safe in Ohio. I shall travel by daylight, stop at the best hotels, go to the dinner-tables with the lords of the land. So good-bye, sir. If you hear that I'm taken, you may know that I'm dead. George stood up like a rock, and put out his hand with the air of a prince. The friendly little old man shook it heartily, and after a little shower of caution, he took his umbrella, and fumbled his way out of the room. George stood thoughtfully looking at the door, as the old man closed it. A thought seemed to flash across his mind. He hastily stepped to it, and opening it, said, "'Mr. Wilson, one more word.' The old gentleman entered again, and George, as before, locked the door, and then stood for a few moments looking on the floor irresolutely. At last, raising his head with a sudden effort, "'Mr. Wilson, you have shown yourself a Christian in your treatment of me. I want to ask one last deed of Christian kindness of you.' "'Well, George?' "'Well, sir, what you said was true. I am running a dreadful risk. There isn't on earth a living soul to care if I die," he added, drawing his breath hard, and speaking with a great effort. I shall be kicked out and buried like a dog, and nobody'll think of it a day after. Only my poor wife. Poor soul, she'll mourn and grieve. And if you'd only contrive, Mr. Wilson, to send this little pin to her. She gave it to me for a Christmas present, poor child. Give it to her, and tell her I loved her to the last, will you? Will you? he added earnestly. Yes, certainly, poor fellow said the old gentleman, taking the pin, with watery eyes and a melancholy quiver in his voice. "'Tell her one thing,' said George. "'It's my last wish, if she can get to Canada, to go there. No matter how kind her mistress is, no matter how much she loves her home, 
beg her not to go back, for slavery always ends in misery. Tell her to bring up our boy a free man, and then he won't suffer as I have. Tell her this, Mr. Wilson, will you? Yes, George, I'll tell her, but I trust you won't die. Take heart. You're a brave fellow. Trust in the Lord, George. I wish in my heart you were safe through, though. That's what I do. Is there a God to trust in? said George, in such a tone of bitter despair, as arrested the old gentleman's words. Oh, I've seen things all my life that have made me feel that there can't be a God. You Christians don't know how these things look to us. There's a God for you, but is there any for us? Oh, now, don't, don't, my boy, said the old man, almost sobbing as he spoke. Don't feel so. There is, there is. Clouds and darkness are round about him, but righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. There's a God, George, believe it, trust in him, and I'm sure he'll help you. Everything will be set right, if not in this life, in another. The real piety and benevolence of the simple old man invested him with a temporary dignity and authority as he spoke. George stopped his distracted walk up and down the room, stood thoughtfully a moment, and then said quietly, Thank you for saying that, my good friend. I'll think of that. End of chapter 11